Thank you. Thank you. And I'm really honored to be here and to cap off this, this series of lectures. And I wish that I could have been here for the rest of them. They, it's such a fascinating topic and that can be explored from so many different angles. So today, uh, we're, we're going to start small. We're going to talk about books, libraries, and the changing digital landscape in America um, in about 40 minutes. So. Uh, very briefly, where I am coming from, uh, geographically and figuratively, I come from the Pew Research Center in Washington, D.C. We're a nonprofit research organization. Um, has, raise your hand if any of you are, have heard of our work or have used it in any way. So, okay. Oh, that's wonderful to see. Um, we, we call ourselves a fact tank. I think we would probably be classified as a think tank, but we don't make policy recommendations. We really try to provide objective data that can be used in those conversations, uh, a common language that people can use when they talk about these important issues today. Um, so we don't promote any specific technologies or make any policy recommendations. And that means that fortunately, I don't have to tell you what the future of libraries is <laughs> or what anyone should do. So, but hopefully what we talk about will be, will be useful to people who are deciding that. Um, this is, this is exciting. This is the end of our, our research series. We've done three phases. Uh, first, we looked at the state of e-reading, because um, as everyone knows, the introduction of Kindles and iPads and all sorts of devices, handheld devices on which we can read books, uh, is, is starting to have a big impact on how people read today. But then we looked at library services more broadly, so what people are using libraries for, trying to get a sense of the landscape of library services uh, and how they're being used in America. And then this third phase that we're just working on now is stepping back even further and looking at where libraries fit into people's larger information habits, how, where libraries fit into their communities, uh, who uses libraries, who doesn't. And our goal is to create a typology where we can talk a little bit more in, in detail about who those people are, uh, looking at them not just in terms of their relationship to libraries, but in terms of how they seek and share information, um, where they turn for other leisure activities. And because we, we are the Pew Internet Project, their technology use in various ways. And this has been funded by a wonderful grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And I'm gonna show a lot of charts, uh, say a lot of facts. All of this is available on our website, libraries.pewinternet.org, um, including these slides. So whenever I say a statistic, uh, almost, almost every time I say a number, that is from our quantitative phone surveys. They're nationally representative. Um, they're on landlines and cell phones. We survey in English and in Spanish. Uh, and we survey Americans ages 16 and older. So we're actually able to even get um, 16, 17 year olds, which we don't normally get in our surveys of American adults. So that means that this is gonna be sort of bird's eye view of how people are using libraries in America. Um, it might be different in your community. It might be different um, in an individual library. This is just the general broad overview of how Americans in general are using libraries today. Um, and that can get, that can get a little, little vague, uh, as you can imagine. So we've done also a lot of qualitative work. We've done focus groups in person. We've done online questionnaires and online focus groups. and really tried to bring out people's stories about how they use libraries because data is just a different way of telling a story and we want to hear also people's individual voices and people telling us how technology has changed their library use, what they want from libraries. Um, so by bringing all of this together, we're, um, hopefully uh, I want to talk about, just give a good portrait of how people use libraries in America today. Now, this is a little tricky to talk about because we, we study technology, and we've been doing that for about 13 years now. We study, or we're studying libraries and technology. Not everything is, not all these changes are due to technology. I just wanna state that up front. We're gonna look a lot at technology in libraries. That's just one part of the picture. The, and as we're gonna see in a couple slides, the way that people get news and information, for instance, was changing before the internet was a major player. 
um, before Facebook, before smartphones. So we're just looking at a small slice of, of those changes, uh, but specifically looking at, uh, right now I just want to look at, this, I call this my very brief history of the internet slide. Um, 1995, 14% of American adults were online. Five years later in 2000, half of adults were online. Uh, today that's about 85%, strongly correlated with age, income, household income, and education levels, as you might expect, um, to the point that the vast majority of adults under age 65 are online, um, and just over half of adults over the age of 65 are online, for instance. And again, uh, income and education are also big factors. Uh, and I just wanted to include this. This is uh, from uh, the, our journalism project, State of the Media report. It's If you want to know how Americans' news habits have been changing, if you're not familiar with it, it's a wonderful project they put out every year. It's called State of the Media, and it's at stateofthemedia.org. This chart starts in 1991, if you can't see it. These, these top lines represent the percent of respondents who got news on a daily basis. People got news yesterday uh, from TV, radio, newspaper. Those are the three main lines you're seeing. As you can see, those have been declining for a while. Again, when this chart started, less than 14% of American adults were online. But in recent years, we have also seen online news increase as a way that people get news. It might not be as high as you think. This chart surprises some people. Um, when, you, when you look at younger adults, it's a little different. They're actually much more likely to get news daily from online sources. TV is much less of a source for them. But I just wanted to, this is my, this is my big picture slide for today, just to point out that there's a lot going on and we're really only looking at a pretty small slice of this today. So where are we today? 91% of American adults have a cell phone. 61% have a laptop computer, 58% have a desktop computer. Um, people are, we've actually seen that switch in recent years. More people have laptops. People are a little more mobile. They do their computing in various places, not just sitting down at a desk, uh, particularly younger people. I really want to focus on these last three. Over half of adults have a smartphone now. 34% have a tablet, and about a quarter have an e-book reader, such as a Kindle or a Nook. Um, this is the digital landscape that I want to look at today because when people get news on their mobile devices, when they consume long-form content on their mobile devices, their habits are a little different. And when you look at this breakdown by age group, uh, we see some really interesting patterns. For most newer technologies, so for smartphones for instance, um, younger adults, those adults in their, their 20s, uh, late teens and early 20s, they were much more likely than anyone else to own smartphones for a while. Uh, other newer technologies, again, younger adults, first on the wagon, then you see lower adoption rates for older adults. Um, but with tablets and e-readers, these are really gadgets that have taken off with adults in the 30s and 40s. Uh, we have, in, including about 50% of parents who own a tablet computer right now. And I'm including 16 and 17 year olds in here. It's a little tricky because they're, when you talk about, say, ownership of a device, a 16 or 17 year old probably owns their smartphone if they have one or owns their cell phone. That's something they personally own, it's theirs. Um, computers, and especially tablets and, and to some extent e-readers, those are more likely to represent shared household use. So it doesn't mean quite the same thing that it might for older age groups. But this is the landscape we have, where almost half of adults in the 30s and 40s have some sort of handheld e-reader, e-reading device. Um, a good chunk of adults in uh, ages 18 29, uh, fewer as you go up. And something that's really interesting that we've seen happen is that when you have these mobile devices and when you consume news on these mobile devices, your habits shift a little. About a third of mobile news consumers, people who get news on their tablets, say that they spend more time with news than they used to. Uh, they're turning to news sources. And about 43% say that this is adding to news they consume. This isn't necessarily replacing what they were doing before. This is, this is new. This is an addition. And I'm, I'm going to talk about this more with e-books, but one general trend that we've seen with technology adoption of all sorts is that 
it doesn't always change people's behavior. What it can do is it can amplify what people are already doing. It can enable people to seek out what they already wanted to find. So we're going to see this a lot with ebooks, for instance, where, especially if you own an ebook reader, uh, like a Kindle or a Nook, you probably bought that device because you love to read. You're already a reader. This is a device that is just letting you access more books, fit more books into your day. And we have seen that e-reading is on the rise. We don't have a lot of data points here, but we do know that just if you look at what type of books people read in the last year, really broad measure. Um, about three quarter of American adults, Americans read a book in the past year, mostly print. Uh, as you can see, predominantly people are reading in print. Um, been a slight decline over the past over the past year, but again, six seven percent of American adults read a book in print in the past year. Ebooks um, now accounts for about twenty three percent of adults said that they did read an ebook uh, in in whole or in part in the past year, and that's up from sixteen percent in two thousand one. So that was. That was mostly the background. I really want to talk about how this breaks down by age and what this means for libraries. Because as you can see, I think this is something that surprises people a lot of the time. The youngest age groups, those 16, 17 year olds, those uh, teenagers still in high school, print is still a big part of their lives. Their reading habits are still grounded in print. Some of them are reading ebooks, about 28% said they read an ebook in the past year, but it's not really replacing print in their diet and their reading habits yet. Um, part of that might be because, just look at these first columns, they're much younger Americans are more likely to read for work and school. I don't think that's surprising to anyone. Um, and also, even though they're starting to be in households with these tablets and e-readers, it's possible that their habits were formed earlier. And they, when we talk to people about reading e-books in general, um, including younger readers, we still are seeing a big preference for print books. People generally don't tell us that they wish that they could read all of their books in ebooks. When we do our qualitative work, people say that they love print, they love the smell of books, they love the feel of the pages. They're really tied to the physical aspects of the book. But when they when they start reading ebooks, they tell us that all of a sudden they could read a book on the bus. They couldn't do that before. You can't carry that heavy biography you've been trying to finish in one hand while you're on a crowded bus during rush hour. But you can read a book on your smartphone. And that's what people are telling us, is that when people do read e-books in addition to print, and it's almost, it seems to be largely in addition to, they can just fit more pages into their day. So far, it seems to be a little more supplemental rather than, that rather than replacing print. And most of them say they don't want it to. But something else that we've only seen glimmers of in our data that I look forward to exploring further is how people are reading their ebooks. Now, if you own a tablet or an e-reader and you read ebooks, if you own an e-reader and you read ebooks, you are reading ebooks on your e-reader. I believe um, the vast majority of people who own that are doing that. That makes sense. Um, but far fewer own e-readers and tablets than own things like cell phones or a computer. And so when you look at how people are reading their ebooks, especially by age, this really interesting pattern emerges where younger adults, those ages 16 to 29, they're much more likely to be reading ebooks on their cell phones or on their desktops or laptop computers. And that might not be because they prefer it that way. We don't know that that's, they, ju they just enjoy reading on, on tiny little screens. It, what seems to be the case is that these are just the devices that they have. And they're drawn to those, those reasons that people read ebooks, to get a book quickly, um, to have a wide selection because you're reading while traveling, and, or you're just in a situation where you can't carry a big print book with you. Um, we ask people who read both print books and ebooks which is better uh, for various activities. Uh, people generally agree that reading, reading with a child is where print really wins out. You want a print book when you're sitting down with a child. Um, you want a print book if you want to share it with others. Um, 
reading in bed, neck and neck, seems to be a lot of controversy over whether ebooks or print books are better. Um, it'll be interesting to see how that changes with, with newer e-reading e options. But interestingly, when people talk about having a wide selection of books to read, when you want to just be able to browse right where you are and get a book right then, ebooks seem to be people's preferred choice. But again, and this is something that's, that's been surprising to us, while the 16 and 17 year olds are still reading print, they're reading for school, they're doing research for school, they might not have these devices, they might not really own them in quite the personal way that their parents do, their parents are reading ebooks. Um, when you look at readers in their 30s and 40s, 4 in 10 read an ebook last year. That's more than any other age group. And as I said, this age group is much more likely to own tablets, much more likely to own e-readers and these sort of dedicated devices for this. So we've seen people's reading habits change. We've seen the shift towards digital in many cases, although not all. People are still really tied to print. When people talk about why they read e-books, they talk about these reasons of convenience. And some people tell us that reading e-books, especially at the library, get them back into reading more print. They search for things. Being able to find a title you want, especially at a library, through a library's e-book system, a lot of people tell us they've had a lot of trouble with that. Uh, about half of e-book borrowers said they've had trouble finding a title they were interested in or that they've um, found had a wait list for something. So a lot of people have told us that sometimes their sometimes their ebook reading habits bring them back into the library, bring them back into print. Others tell us that there's always a few people who just seem like they were waiting for ebooks to happen, like they were waiting for the internet, and they are so excited <laughs> that they don't have to put up with that that musty book smell. They hate it so much. Um, we hear from them, but mostly we hear from people that they love the convenience of ebooks. But they really love print books. They love the books themselves. And this has a lot of implications for libraries, because libraries are more than books today. Um, I think that's, and that's something we're going to talk about more in a bit. Libraries are more than books, but their, their foundation is books. And especially when you ask people the first word that comes to mind when you talk about libraries, they say books. Not reading, but they say books. And so this is something that's really tricky for libraries going forward. As you'll see, we're going to talk about what people do at libraries, how they think about libraries, what they value. And a lot of what they value is still really tied to books, especially their childhood experiences a lot of times. And that idea of a quiet place. People talk about libraries almost like a church sometimes. They talk about them with reverence. But a quiet place for books and learning and sitting alone by yourself and discovering new authors, new voices that you didn't know about before. These are what people talk about in focus groups when we talk about first library use. And I think it has some pretty big implications for what people want from libraries in the future. So this chart shows how library visitors, people who visit a library in person, how they use libraries. So about 53% of American adults visited a library in person in the past year. Um, Americans age 16 and older, and about another quarter visited the library website, all told about 56% used the library in some fashion in the past year. And when they go to libraries, they are borrowing books, borrowing print books, they're browsing the stacks. Three quarters of library visitors did these things in the past year. Um, so as you can see, books and browsing, they're still central to how people use the library. Uh, researching topics of interest, getting help from a librarian, these are also done by a majority of library visitors. So when we talk about, we're going to talk about a lot of other technological behaviors at libraries, things that people want from libraries, how libraries could fit into people's more digital lives. But it's worth noting that right now, um, this was the survey is from November 2012, people's library habits, especially with public libraries, which is what our work is based on, are really centered around books, reading, reading and browsing, which is something that's going to become more important later. And you see this again when we ask people what it's important for libraries to offer. Um, we ask just the general public, Americans ages 16 and older, 
uh, about a variety of services that libraries offer. Um, and the top two that people said are very important, with 80% of people saying these are very important services for libraries to provide um, librarians to help people find information and having books to borrow. But change is also happening. Um, this is a quote from a library staff member. Talk, we asked about ways that library use has changed in the past few years. Um, our customers are still using the library, but in different ways. They browse our catalog online, place reservations on the items they want, then pick them up at their location of choice. Fewer browse the collection in person. <clears throat> so when we also talk about these changes that are happening with the internet, because that's, and in many ways, that's the elephant in the room here, is the internet, that you don't need to go to a place, a physical place, um, with walls and stacks of books to find information generally. Um, whether or not you can find the information you're looking for in the format you need, the time you need, that's, that's different. But in general, people have many more options just for finding information. And librarians have told us that uh, more general research questions, what's the capital of Wisconsin? Um, they, they don't get asked that at the reference desk anymore. What they are asked for help for um, is how to use their tablet. I got this tablet at Christmas. Um, it might still be in the box, still wrapped, but uh, people are coming to libraries for help with their technology, for help with the tools to help them access that information. And we've seen more broadly that people are thinking about libraries as technology hubs and as facilitators for accessing um, information through technological means. So this shows technology and media use of the library. About 46% of patrons said that they've used a research database in the past year. Um, about 40% borrow, have borrowed a DVD. Um, that skews older. Younger people are actually much less likely to say they've done this. Um, and about a quarter of patrons use the computer internet at the library in the past year. Um, we also have audiobooks and music CD borrowing on here. Ebooks is not on here. It's a little smaller. 5% um, of recent library users say that they have borrowed an ebook in the past year as of late 2012. Um, E-reading starting to get going. About a quarter of Americans 16 and older have read an e-book. But again, e-book borrowing, much less common. So That doesn't mean that they don't have an outsized impact. Because when our first phase of research, when we studied e-books at libraries, and we studied how people, especially people who read e-books, how their library use is changing and how they how they interact with ebooks at the library. Um, when we spoke to library staff members, we heard so much <laughs> about the special challenges of ebooks at libraries. About just, if you think about trying to replicate, and I'm, I know some previous speakers have talked about this, but the challenges of trying to replicate or supplement or, or in any way parallel the print collections um, from the ground up with often very different licensing structures and relationships uh, with publishers. And it's confusing. We heard over and over again from library staff members. Um, they talk a lot of, with patrons about how to get books onto the e-readers, how to get books off of the e-readers. Um, returning an e-book on a uh, Kindle was a very, very tricky thing. Some of our focus groups turned into um, impromptu tech help sessions where patrons would tell each other, explain to each other how their local library systems worked. Um, and this is something that when we talk about newer technologies at libraries, something that came up over and over was librarians talking about training, how they might not have any, or how the training they had didn't help them answer patrons' questions. And so many librarians told us that they're starting to experiment themselves, and that's something that they've had to do, just keep up with their patrons' questions. They need to be a step ahead, um, maybe not for all patrons. Um, again, only about 5% of recent library users borrowed an e-book, but they're creating an out this outsized demand on resources in some ways where um, the systems are a bit more complicated. They're a little bit trickier than just going straight to a bookstore, straight to Amazon, or straight to another service. Um, and so this is something that librarians are dealing with. This is something that patrons are dealing with. Um, some librarians have 
debated whether or not they want to start offering ebooks, that the system is still so complicated. Um, these are all big questions. And these are things that right now ebooks are, when we talk about ebooks, they're primarily at public libraries. But a lot of academic libraries and school libraries have talked about um, offering, I mean, school, a lot of schools are offering ebook, e textbooks now, um, other digital resources. So this is something that will be really interesting to watch going forward. <clears throat> on, the other, on the other end, while we have uh, just 5% of recent library users checking out ebooks, more broadly, when we asked people about whether or not their library offers ebooks, um, the most common response was, I don't know. There's not a lot of awareness of ebooks at libraries. So people are starting um, to think of People think of libraries as tech hubs, especially when it comes to computer and internet access. Um, as you can see, having free access to computers and the internet actually rivals ha uh, books and librarians as something that people say it is very important for libraries to offer. Um, and that's something that comes up again and again in focus groups when we talk about things that it's important for libraries to have. Um, in general, people agree that libraries should be places where anyone can go online um, that the internet is increasingly important now, and that is that if you want to find uh, information, if you need to do all sorts of activities, from file your taxes to access certain government benefits to apply for a job, trying to do that without the internet um, is increasingly difficult. So people really identify libraries as an important resource um, for having internet and computer access. Also research databases, which um, is something that people really value. But again, there's not a lot of awareness of these newer services like ebooks, um, including about 58% of library cardholders who said that they don't know if their library offers ebooks. I believe, according to the ALA, American Library Association, I think about seven in 10 libraries um, now offer ebooks. But again, awareness is not, has not really caught up. And that's something we heard in our focus groups also, is when we started talking about any service, there were always people who turned to the, the speaker and said, wait, I didn't know you could do that at the library. <laughs> and in general, only about a quarter of Americans say that they are aware of all or most of the services offered by their local library. Awareness in general, um, not just about ebooks, but about all sorts of services, is something that, um, that Americans say they're not sure of and that some of the libraries are struggling with. <clears throat> and this final, final section about libraries, uh, how Americans are using libraries, I want to spotlight something that we don't talk about as much. It's easy for us to talk about technologies. Again, we study technology. We think about it a lot. But, and when people talk about libraries, they talk about books first, and they talk about uh, the importance of com computers, and they talk about this wonderful quiet space they remember from their childhoods. But today when you talk to people about how they use libraries, and if you ask them to construct their perfect library, um, they talk about a community center. And about half, half of uh, library patrons said that they just use the library as just a space to sit, to be, to study. Um, about 41% have it brought their children or, or attended if, if, they're, if they're younger, an event for children or teens. Um, and about a quarter have also attended a meeting of a group, one in five have attended a class or lecture. Um, and what's really interesting about this is that those, those younger Americans, those ages 16, 29, those under 30, they're actually more likely to use the library as a physical space. They're actually more likely to go to the library um, to sit, read, and spend time, which makes sense. When we talk to librarians, they tell us that often there aren't many options for teens, for younger patrons. There aren't that many places where you can go and sit and study, talk to others, have, use free Wi-Fi, um, especially without buying something. Um, one of our focus groups with, with patrons ended up in a, a discussion about whether um, about using McDonald's for the free Wi-Fi versus using your local library. <laughs> and um, especially parents talking about why they preferred the library, why that was a preferred space. <laughs> but there aren't always that many spaces for people to go. And 
I just think it's really interesting that even as people maybe don't need the library as a physical repository of books as they, they don't necessarily need it in that role, although it certainly is uh, still vital for some, um, more and more people are talking about just the, the importance of having a space where you can run into other people in your community. Um, whenever people try to describe their ideal library, they always seemed to settle on Starbucks. Like that was, that was what they described, was they described a Starbucks mm -hmm. or um, Barnes Noble or Borders um, when there were more of those. Just that, that quiet space, you know, there are books around and that was great, but they really enjoyed just, what one man described it as America's living room. That's what he liked. He liked having a space where you could be private or public depending on how you're feeling. You could have that quiet somewhere or you could just have that sort of, you know, the, the calm hubbub of just general conversation. Um, and so that's one thing that we don't always talk about as much, but it's still when people talk about what's important for libraries to offer, um, they bring this up. Quiet study spaces are really important, um, but also programs for children and teens, which are decidedly not quiet. Um, having free events and activities, even offering free public meeting spaces, um, not, not as many people said that was very important, but still 49% said it was, and most people say, it's, yes, that's something that libraries should offer. If you got lost, that was a lot of slides. 56% uh, of Americans used the library in the past year in some way. Books, browsing librarians, still really important. Technology and community spaces, um, also important, though less talked about. All right. So when we ask people about what services they would use at a library, what we, we focus, as you can see, on more technological services. Um, ask a librarian online services, well, apps that will give you access to library resources, um, technology tryout programs where you could go and use an e-reader or a tablet for the first time, just see if you liked it. Um, people are generally open to this. This was asked of just the general population, not just library users. As you can see, out a third of people were open to most of these uh, overall. Um, there's that somewhat likely section in the middle that, that they're open to it. They don't have, have a firm, um, firm feelings towards it either way. And um, far fewer said they would not, not at all, uh, weren't likely at all to use these services. I find this really interesting, partially just because there is no clear, there's no clear winner here. There's no clear service that Americans are crying out for. And I think it also just shows that people are open to a lot of experiences at their libraries. People don't always think about libraries as for what they could do at libraries, but people think a lot about problems they have and about problems they need solved and about things they need to do and resources they wish they had. Um, and so I think that might be a better way to talk about this. For instance, uh, so you can see a majority of Americans say they would be at least somewhat likely to use a cell phone, GPS-based cell phone app to find their way around the library. That just means that most li Americans are getting lost in libraries. <laughs> <laughs> they might need an app, they might need a map, they might need signs. Um, but I just think this is really interesting just to see what sort of needs people have, what sort of, um, sort of things they would be open to. I thought it was really interesting that not too many people, even though most people don't use e-readers, um, there's not a huge amount of interest in classes on how to use e-readers. Uh, actually, adults in ages 50 to 64 are a little more likely than others to say that this is something that they would want to do. Um, and maybe that's something that isn't a, a huge, um, doesn't have a huge audience, but for those people, it might be really important. Um, some of these things, like offering library kiosks throughout the community, um, seem to be fairly popular just because when people, when people talk about how they use libraries, one thing, one thing that anyone who has used a library or has worked at one will be aware of is just the hassle of overdue fines and getting that book back in on time, which is still something that e-books, um, people say they do love about borrowing e-books is lack of fines, it just disappears. But 
there's a lot of things that people, a lot of ways that people have told us that they want, a lot of ways that they want to interact with libraries, maybe outside of the library walls. Um, whether having these kiosks give you access to, to resources throughout your community. Um, we asked about this um, sort of offering red box style kiosks. Um, a lot of communities don't have um, a place to borrow DVDs, for instance, outside of a red box. Um, these days, personalized accounts is another one that I want to talk about more in a little bit, but when we brought this up with librarians, we've got two very different responses. One was, we already do this, like we, we just personalized accounts to offer recommendations. Um, one response was, we already do this. It's called ask your librarian what books you should be reading, because they <laughs> are pretty good at recommending those. Um, and then others said, well, we can't do this, really. This isn't something we can jump into because of privacy concerns. Because the last thing we want to do is keep a running list of all the books that our patrons borrow and use that to tell them things about themselves. That's just antithetical to everything we do. Um, so all of that is just to say, this is not a list of recommendations necessarily, um, but hopefully it helps, helps us talk more about what needs people have in their communities around, around books, around accessing information, and where libraries might fit into that. Because what's also really interesting, so when we ask people in a slightly different way about what libraries should do. Um, most of these things, the most popular items, they aren't tech heavy. They're coordinating more with schools. 85% of Americans say that libraries should definitely coordinate more with schools. In focus groups, parents say that you know, they don't know why their student was assigned, everyone was assigned one of five books for a book report, and the library didn't have nearly enough copies. Um, now, uh, librarians and teachers will tell you there are all sorts of reasons why it's difficult to have two, two institutions um, you know, in sync on those issues, but that's something that people said was really important to them, that they really wanted to see happen. Um, free literacy programs, something, I mean, it, there's, it's not an app, it's not a device, it's really at the core of what li many libraries have been doing for a long time. And this has tremendous support in the, for the, among the general public. Um, and then some, uh, some of these other things talk, speak more to those issues of the library as a community center, library as a space. Uh, people say the library should have separate spaces so that you can have all these different activities. So you can have the loud teens area over here and so that you can have the quiet study area over here. Um, they want more comfortable spaces, places where you could spend time, you could stretch out, relax. Um, most Americans well, most Americans don't know if their local library offers e-books, but they think that libraries should offer more. Um, <laughs> something else we found. And I thought it was really interesting, the least popular services we asked about, the things that, at the bottom of this list, um, when we asked about moving most library services online, when we asked about move, making most services automated. Um, as you can see, some people think libraries should definitely do this, but most people are much more ambivalent. These are not things that people really support in quite the same ways. And I think that goes back to what we talked about earlier, is just people value having a library full of books, and they value having a librarian there in person to help them. And in fact, when we ask them, we ask people if we should move stacks out of public locations um, to make room, perhaps, for all of these other services that you, you could provide, just one in five said that that was, you know, that was a good option. <coughs> so we see a lot of tensions here. We see a lot of conflicting, and maybe not conflicting, but uh, parallel impulses. Um, in general, people support having more activities, more uh, events for children and teens, separate spaces, just more happening at the library, more, I mean, libraries, in many ways, are all things to all people. That's what we hear when we talk to librarians. They tell us that their number one goal is to serve the needs of their communities, and communities are made, of, made up of many different types of people. But at the same time, people don't want their libraries to change too drastically. They want the books. They want the print books. They want the quiet spaces. 
and there are still people who really value these things. They might not always need them, but um, as some people told us, things get loud. Outside, be really loud. The mall is loud, Starbucks is loud, everyone has, um, everyone's on their cell phone, everyone's cell phone is going off even if they're ignoring it. Um, you just need a quiet space sometimes. And it's, it's increasingly hard to find that sometimes. But while people want this physical space with the books and librarians and, and that personal connection, they also want convenience. People are really busy. Especially when we talk with parents, they tell us that they wish they, wish they could get in and out of the library faster on days when they need to get in and out of the library quickly. But they also wish that they had that personal connection with the librarian so the librarian could tell them what services for their children they don't know about. Um, really just to tell them what they don't know they don't know. And that's something we heard from not just parents but all sorts of people who use libraries and they interact with them in some ways but they're really not, they're not sure of what they're missing and they don't know how to go about finding it. <clears throat> and this puts libraries in a tricky position sometimes. So on the one hand, when you can, um, like that quote earlier said, when people can reserve books online, when they can access uh, all sorts of digital resources online, not just library resources, but search engines, um, there are fewer places where you need to physically see a librarian and talk to a library staff member to, to get these things. You have fewer touch points. Um, and we have, we're seeing this, well, we don't know if it's a trend, but a lower, in general, awareness of library services. The other side of that, something that we hear from librarians, something especially, um, I talk a bit more about, looking at students, really. But they say that while technologies have given us fewer touch points, maybe, they've also increased the opportunities for connections, for personal connections, but just in different ways. Um, through social media, email, apps, websites, if people, many librarians say that they're looking for ways to connect with people where the people are going. If people are looking for information, um, I mean, most people don't, when they go to a library website, they don't go to the website to look for information resources, they go to the library website to look for information about the library. Um, they look for hours, they re try to reserve books, they pay their fines. These are the main things people use library websites for, for instance. So something a lot of librarians are thinking about is, so if people are going to other places, if they're going to Google for their general information queries, how do we go there too? How do we meet them there? Um, and offering these personalized services, these recommendations, it's tricky with a lot of the current, a lot of the current setups. Again, librarians are juggling these privacy concerns, um, their own resources, what they have just available technologically at the library. But in other ways, librarians have always been gatekeepers of information. Not necessarily in the sense of keeping you out, but in helping you, helping you get in, helping you find your way. And I mean, Reader's Advisory, helping people, helping people find books, saying, if you like this, you might also like this. That's something libraries have been doing for a very long time. Um, so really just the, the tricky part of that is becoming a part of that process again. And that's something the librarians have told us that they're thinking about and working on and, and really trying to, trying to address is just how you become part of a process that, um, in some cases, uh, can begin and end with the search engine. And this expands just beyond a novel uh, for your vacation. This is just looking at when people look for information more broadly, there's a lot more of it now. There's a lot more of it and I mean, when it's online, it's hard to know what's good. It's hard to know what you can trust. Um, this might not matter so much if you're looking for a movie time, but I mean, if you, if you get a scary health diagnosis, if you're help, helping care for a loved one, um, if you have an important issue in your life, if you need to apply for government services, you need that good information. You, you don't have time for the bad, or you might be terrifying to find the wrong information. Um, 
So just in the broader sense of digital literacies, helping people learn how to find and vet information, I think, is something that a lot of people, a lot of librarians say, we can help with this. <clears throat> so it's not just providing access to the information, just the books. It's providing guidance. It's providing access to tools, those computers and the internet. Um, even teens, I mean, most, about, I think 93% of teens aged 12 to 17 have access to a computer at home. But most of them say that the one they use most often is one they share with friends or share with family members. Um, so even though they have, so this is just something just to keep in mind, when you look at those numbers of who owns which devices, um, having access to something might not be the same as having round the clock whenever you need it access. Um, and printers break, computers break. Uh, we hear, especially in our focus groups, people who have all sorts of devices at home, they still rely on the library for those moments when you really need it. Access to information resources as well, those things that you, things that you can't Google, essentially. Um, this is a bit of an awareness issue as well. A lot of librarians have told us that sometimes they really struggle to let patrons know that there are things out there beyond that you can't access with a search engine. Uh, proprietary databases, things that are hidden away, things that um, may not respond to a search, simple search query um, or a full sentence question, which is a way, um, which is also a way of searching. And then how to use these tools. How to use that tablet you got for Christmas. How to use, how to use email for the first time. When you were, you had a job and you were working and you never needed to touch a computer and now you lost that job and you need a new one, but all the applications you're looking for are online. And then that big one, how to find the information, how to find the good stuff, how to verify it, how to vet it, how to know that this is what you need. <clears throat> because even, this isn't just people, this isn't just important for people who haven't, aren't that familiar with the internet, aren't that familiar with these technologies. <coughs> when we ask teachers at a uh, national writing project in college board schools, so pretty elite group of students here, middle and high school students, we ask these teachers how their students research, what sources they're very likely to turn to. The top two answers were Google or another search engine and Wikipedia. Um, also YouTube and social media. We use, uh, majority said their students are very likely to turn to those. Um, and online databases, research librarians, uh, just printed books in general beyond the textbooks. Far fewer teachers said that their students are likely to turn to these. And teaching these skills is really difficult. Um, one of my colleagues, Kristen Purcell, has done some really interesting work um, looking at how, how students research, how their, teachers, how their teachers judge their research skills, how their teachers say that they should, say that they should be doing research. And there's, it's very tricky to teach research skills online. It's very tricky to teach students who are learning about these topics how to find and vet information online um, about things about which they are not experts. Those are really sophisticated research skills. Those are things that um, much more experienced researchers struggle with. And there's not always a lot of class time. So teachers generally tell us that the internet is great for offering new resources, for offering um, Students access things they never would have had access to otherwise. But, and most teachers say that overall, internet has had a positive effect on student learning. But on the other hand, there's so much information out there and the students feel pretty confident about their search abilities, but their teachers say they're just, they don't have it down yet. <coughs> and there's a lot there. There's a lot, um, there are a lot of ways to teach this. And teachers tell us they, there's no one clear way to teach it. I mean, there's no simple, easy way to teach these sophisticated research skills, to teach someone how to approach a source skeptically and determine who it was written by and who they're writing it for. Some teachers will just require a mix of online and offline sources to sort of force their students into the stacks, force their students um, to at least interact with those resources. Um, most teachers say that they are talking about how to find good information online, but far fewer are really talking about how to, say, construct an advanced search query. Um, 
when we, ta when we talk to teachers uh, in focus groups about how they do this, we heard all sorts of, all sorts of approaches. Some, one teacher said that she encouraged her students to, um, they, they would look for fake photos or hoaxes online, um, especially about celebrities, things students knew about, um, and they would debunk them and they would tr try to prove or disprove these images. Um, so they brought it into the students, uh, perhaps something they did know about, something that they, they were somewhat of an expert on, and practice those skills there. Others said that they, <clears throat> one teacher said that he's just too busy, so he offers, he gives the students five websites and says, so when you do your research online, you go to these five websites, <laughs> and you'll get, they all have good information, and, and you're done. And he says, I, I know this isn't ideal, but I don't teach in a theoretical world. This is, this is what we need to do in order to get these papers in on time. Um, and there's, there's a lot of confusion, and students know that many students think that they're doing pretty good with their search engines, but when we talk to them a bit more, some of them say, I know that I can't, I know that I'm not really out there on my own. I know that my teachers are often holding my hand. I know that my, I don't really know how to do this by myself. Um, and in some of our work with librarians, one librarian told us that she'll get high school students and college students who come in and say, I need to do this, I need to do this research for class. And so she, she takes them to the databases. We sit down at the computer and log in the databases. And then the student says, no, no, no. My teacher said no online resources. <laughs> So then you have this discussion of, is this an online resource? Well, yes, it's on the internet. You're accessing it through the internet, but it's not really an online resource. This isn't what your teacher says. It's hard to say, this isn't what your teacher meant. Because again, these are really complex issues. And a lot of the times, a lot of teachers say that they don't really have time to teach this, that so this is the English, some of the English teachers should teach. Um, or they'll talk about sort of these general distinctions about no Wikipedia, use print books, um, use a mix of online and offline sources. But again, there's no, simple, there's no simple equation for how to find a good source online and how to synthesize that into a larger argument. And that's something, that's something librarians do. That's something that librarians tell us they wish they could do more of. They wish people turned to them for help with this. People say, oh, I don't want to bother you, but... And a lot of librarians say, no, please bother us. This, this is our job. But when people can search for things online, I think when it's, when it's very easy for them to do so, um, many of them, when we talk to them about actually going up and, and talking to a person at the library for help with this, some of them are a little more reluctant. Um, yeah, they don't want to take up your time. They could probably just do this on Google, but they're hitting a brick wall and they need help. And I think this is something that we're starting to see librarians step back into, um, to be, be a part of this process now, because it's, we're seeing more complicated research queries. Once you've done the simple Google search and you've, you've searched for the basic things, now it's trickier. Now you need, now you're at a, in a medical database looking at you know, research journals, and now you need an expert. And that's something that some librarians have told us they've been seeing is they're not getting questions like what's the capital of Wisconsin. Um, they are getting questions about how to navigate these databases and how to, you know, what does this mean? What does this, um, you know, this is written in a certain foreign jargon that I'm not familiar with. Help me decipher it. So they're seeing more complex research queries. Um, when they do introduce people to databases, um, many say it's like a light bulb goes on. Like people just weren't aware that this was really an option. Um, and I haven't even touched on it, but there's all sorts of new literacies, new types of information that we're seeing and trying to figure our way through just to see if, you know, is this photo real or fake? Is this um, video something I can trust? Is there are all sorts of new ways that we share information today, and um, even just social media. How do you, some, like one librarian said that, you know, someone, will, a patron will come up and say, someone said something mean about me on Facebook. 
that's not really something the librarian can help with, but it's a whole new world that people need help navigating. <clears throat> so just to wrap up, I think these two quotes really summarize what we're seeing in our research and what we're hearing from people more anecdotally. But these are from librarians. <clears throat> First one is, our strength is connecting the community with technology and knowledge. Um, and I love this because it, it addresses those deeper issues of needing to, con need to connect people with knowledge. It's not necessarily about the form that it's in, whether it's in a book or in an app or online. The goal, and this is something we heard over and over again from librarians, is that the goal is just to make that connection and to help people make that connection no matter, no matter what form it takes. And the second one is simply, a warm, welcoming, and friendly space is hard to find these days. And we had so many wonderful responses. If you want to see more of these, they're at um, bit.ly slash libthoughts, L-I-B. And I think that said, if anyone has any questions, happy to talk about them or if we have sandwiches. But thank you. Thank you.